I just want to report on some preliminary work that we've been uh, starting to work on. Uh, we now have two graduate students who are helping out with the day class. They're here, uh, and and uh, uh, we've had a couple of meetings and started to investigate some of the uh, available online resources to try to duplicate some of the measures that uh, Skolkovo has used. And in the course, we've discovered that some of those methods are probably not going to be replicable in China. So if we're going to keep doing, try to pursue a comparative project, we're going to have to think of alternatives, perhaps, and redo them for Russia. Sorry, uh, if we want to make them uh, more com comparable. So the first issue that came up um, in thinking about extending this to China was, uh, which cities should we do and how many? Because there are a lot more cities in China than in Russia, and in fact, I was amazed. Yeah, there, there are 10 that are over 10 million population, not one, and that there are 22 with a population over 5 million, not two, which is the case in Russia. And if we went to the 1 million category, we'd have 143 uh, cities in, in China to look at. Uh, so, uh, I think initially, for, for as many indicators as we can, we will just try to you know, do all of these, but some that require lots of uh, you know, online searching of hospital or government <laughs> websites, that actually could amount to a lot of work, although we could maybe you know, outsource the work through Alibaba, through <laughs> uh, by finding some programmers who can scrape the information uh, faster and whatnot, but anyhow, that's that's an, it's going to be an issue for India too, to think about the right uh, scale and scope. Um, and of course, we could. Well, it sounds like. Well, in Russia, it's funny. I mean, if if you go, this is one city, this is two cities, and then you really have everything else would have to go to the one million, right? Because everything else is between one and two million. So to be comparable in some sense, you'd have to go to the. 143 Chinese cities. I don't know how many that would be in, in India. And the other thing, oh, the, the first point is, I think we also should clarify what the definition of a city is, just in terms of measuring the population. F from other work I know, there's actually no standard international definition for what a city is, the boundary of a city. And different countries tend to use different uh, principles to define <laughs> who's in the city and who's not in the city. So that's another issue. We should at least compare notes about that, although we probably won't be able to do too much about that. Okay, so um, a number of the Russian measures of demand are coming from the search engine results. And in China, Baidu is the Yandex, so it's the, uh, the dominant search engine um, that's used by, by people in, in the country. And uh, it, uh, we did some, some reports suggested it has about a 70% market share on search. Um, and it turns out there is a website called Baidu Index, which does help people collect search engine, uh, search result data, uh, maybe perhaps as a service to advertisers, potential advertisers and whatnot. And they have two, um, two components. One is PC-based searches, and they've added a mobile-based search kind of result. I don't know if that's distinguished in the, in the Russian data or not. Um, Baidu produces an index for search words uh, where they normalize the keyword searches by the number of times the keyword appears in Baidu news. So somehow they want to hide uh, some absolute numbers, I guess. So they normalize in this way. I don't think that's an issue because I think it's a national number, right? It's, yeah. The, the Baidu news in the past three days is going to be one number for the whole country, right? I mean, it's for, so anyway. Uh, but we figured out a way to be able to collect city level data if we buy a certain software application, right? <laughs> a privately produced uh, software application that can, that can use the Baidu index and scrape out all the information by, by city. Uh, so I think this is going to be very feasible for us to duplicate. We'll start by duplicating the search terms that Russia started with our best version, best guess of the translations, and then maybe try to do some uh, playing around with alternative search words that we can think of or that are suggested by Baidu Index 
and then make a decision on which terms to use. Actually, we'd probably like to understand how you guys triangulated on the final search words that use, just so we have a some. We're not doing something uh, crazily different. As I said, we used uh, well both Yandex and Google. They have a backend for advertisers, uh, which is very efficient in terms of accessing uh, assessing the number of uh, words, and they do have. It's for free. They, you, you, you can because you can advertise by city, so you can have everything uh, split by city. And then it also has a phonetic service. I don't know if it's relevant for Chinese, but Russian is a very reflective language in which one word can come in, in, in numerous forms. Because we, so it, it's, it's right in the front, it's right in the end. So to have uh, the, the automatic service which accounts for this, so it gives you all the possible forms of the word uh, already counted. So you don't need to do this manually. And they also have this service for finding synonyms once again. You don't need so if you so it includes the synonym searches in the result for the search word you put in. Just uh, tackle the. You just check it. So yeah, it check yes. it. Include the synonyms, and then it will give you all the list of the synonyms. So it's very very developed, and basically, I guess it was uh, initially introduced by Google, and then Yandex sort of copycat this. Uh, it's, it's really very good. All right. I don't think we need to go into all the details, but we may follow up. Uh, okay, and the other area that we looked at was data on reta online retail. And here the big player in China is Alibaba, uh, Taobao, which is the uh, actually popular in Russia, I think. A lot of people in Russia were purchasing at the recent 11.11, right? There were articles showing Russians ordering from Chinese Taobao. Uh, to deliver to Russia. Um, uh, so Alibaba Research, the research department has uh, been issuing reports called Alibaba E-Commerce Development Index. They, so they do this for the top 100 cities and I, I gathered that they did a survey of the top 204 cities. Uh, I don't know if we can get the index value for all of the cities, only the top 100, is that right, from the reports? Okay. Um, and so these you can get online the reports. Uh, so it's quite nice because the sub, they have they have two. This development index is the sum of two sub, two separate indices. One trying to reflect supply and one trying to reflect demand. And the supply is the e, is is called the e-commerce index, which consists of the density of online stores measured by the number of stores in the city divided by the population in the city and the average value of transaction per store in the city. And the demand side is the e-purchase index, which is the proportion of online consumers, I guess through their websites, in the total population and the amount of online consumption per capita. So that's actually the amount of purchases uh, through, which is a very nice number to be able to have. So it's, I think, uh, can, can be pretty useful and uh, I have actually been thinking, uh, this is maybe a little bit different than the way you were just talking. I mean, we could probably work with Alibaba and try to get the data for all the cities. Uh, we could get data for Russia from them, for example, it would be a very good proxy because then they will see how they are really very popular and they really strong of the minds. So. Uh, could use the data for our right um, okay so that's that's what we've done on the retail side and then uh, just in terms of thinking about the methodology so this first issue I already raised about can supply and demand be identified separately and some of the non replicable measurements in the Russian kind of list of their uh, how they constructed these indices were these two one was this delivery points for goods purchased online uh, which actually I think Sanjay was suggesting that this is not really a supply, it's still a demand measure. You could think of it as a demand measure as well, right? This is reflecting the demand. I mean, the supply might be people selling to, selling on the, online. Uh, I mean, that's, that was I, I would think of as supply, people based, stores based in the area that are selling online. I think that's what the Alibaba one uh, in, supply index is getting at. And I don't know if there's any way to, uh, to proxy that. I mean, you could also just 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's an e-way. Maybe you could even search for those and find out how many there are. But anyway, that just a, just some thinking out loud of how to make. Uh, I mean, for us, I think we'd really like to use the Alibaba data. So uh, the better we can do on the Russia side to get something like that, or I don't know if it's available on the India side or how much online activity there is in retail uh, in India. And then the last area, I just jotted down some notes on new measurements. Uh, you know, for transportation in China, the using Uber is really popular. Uh, there's a big generational differences in China, especially young people are doing everything online and old people don't do anything online. So I think demographics is also something we should probably think about controlling for or looking at the correlations and how they affect. Um, uh, I don't know, we haven't, we haven't looked about the availability of data on that. Um, and then for the government services, so um, Vladimir didn't talk about it, but they, they use these checklists where they go to the websites of the city government and they just check about what, what you can find on that website, a few characteristics. But I was trying to think that we should maybe go to more effort to think about what are the key services that people actually use in different cities, which might be different in Russia and in China and in India. But uh, you know, why would why would a typical person go ha, need to go to a government office to do something? And if we think about those specific things, then you could just think about what can you accomplish online? Can you schedule an appointment? Can you find all the relevant information, et cetera? And that would maybe relate more directly to life lifestyle. And then the education, we also had this felt that the uh, just the use of the MOOC supply seemed like uh, kind of imperfect that. You'd want to actually look at the demand. The, well, there's a demand for the MOOC, I guess, in the thing. But also, we thought maybe looking at the local university functionality, their website functionality, similar to kind of the healthcare and the government service one. That can you, what can you do online at the universities? And also for universities, it's also what students and faculty can do online. Uh, I don't know what the level of development is, and maybe it's all very well developed in Russia, but. You know, can you get electronic journals? Can you, you know, online course sites and things like that? Maybe that's universal everywhere, but maybe we could explore the, that direction as well. I mean, I think for the project as a whole, uh, I think we as a group need to kind of rethink the methodology a little bit, partly due to measurement issues, but partly maybe just also just hoping to improve the methodology over time through feedback. Well, I personally like all, all, all three suggestions. Uh, on university functionality, one thing, I don't know how it happens in China, in Russia usually you have to be registered to get full access to the functionality. I mean, you have to be either a student or part of the faculty. Yeah. Uh, otherwise you will see only part of it, but basically we can somehow circumvent this. But I, I like, uh, do you have only Uber or do you have other, like get taxi for example? Oh yeah, we have, they're, I just did Uber because people would understand Uber, but they're, they're DD uh, and uh, DD bought Uber and... In China, Uber sold, it's, it's uh, called it's Uber. It's sold, so now they're merged, but they're still operating separately, right? Uh, the, the, yes. Yeah. But uh, your concept, your, your point is, yes, yes right, it is basically is online travel app for... Yeah. So, if, if we manage to find data on Alibaba for Russia, it will be marvelous and probably for India also. The one thing which I see now uh, missing is finance and we should think about if we don't take um, any... Well, it's probably not a very good proxy anyway. So I'm, I will not miss it much, but if we, we need to find some measurement of, of supply and finance uh, to have to be applicable across Russia, China, and India. Probably, if we can come up with something. But right. Yeah, I think on uh, there's a lot of interest in on on the on, finan on the financing, and even things like crowd finance. You know crowdsourcing for money and other kinds of... Uh, we, we, we try to use data of the... So we have a very dominant bank on the market, which is Bank, which is partly state-owned, so it covers 
probably 70 percent of the retail market, but they don't report, uh, and they have online banking definitely, but they wouldn't report on its usage uh, by city and as we uh, we try right to avoid negotiating with them about getting this data, because it would be probably very, very long. So we could find some other proxy for supply finance. Right. I mean, one thought would be, I think there are probably companies, like if you're a, if, if you're like a international bank and you're trying to do some market research, there's probably some companies that you could say, I want to know in these Chinese cities, these Russian cities and these Indian cities, what, you know, they could maybe get proprietary data or give you a, because they've developed these information sources or whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Right. I, I'm, I don't even know if that exists, but I'm just... But in India, you know, the amount of uh, cashless transactions is uh, of great interest now. Yes, and exactly. With the recent reforms and... Right. And we might have the ability to get some data on that in the city. Okay. Um, so... So you you think that the India side will be able to kind of get engaged in this data collection? Yeah. Okay. There is a lot of interest in uh, ISP uh, So one part of it is that the Modi government has come up with this idea of 100 smart cities. Right. And of course, nobody understands what smart city really means in that context. but. Uh, then this is part of it. This is digital life would be part of it, so that there is a lot of interest in that. Then uh, there is a lot of interest in the amount of online transactions, and we have some uh, data on those as well. Uh, so we have data on the use of debit and credit cards uh, by city and, uh, and by even monthly, but even daily intervals if we wanted, but you know, it's not. Uh, uh, and it's used for online transactions versus offline in uh, different categories like uh, food and so on. I see. So, uh, yeah, so we have that. Is that proprietary data or is that? That is proprietary data. Yeah, okay. yeah, but we can use it for you know, this sort of project. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, another way to go is to not, I mean, the, we could try to take advantage of the comparative quality of data on different aspects of digital life in different countries and not force everything. I mean, there could be one common component, but there could be a, a more, you know, country-specific component, too, to, if, it, if the goal is to try to, to make some point, right, uh, that's analytical, uh, which I think, I mean, I'm viewing this also, I think, as you are, as a window into just trying to gather all the relevant data on these different dimensions because there is a lot of research interest. And for us on the China side, I think we'd also like to go way back in time if possible and to trace the kind of the spread of this uh, digital penetration over time and try to understand why certain cities it was happening faster than others and try to you know, as, as uh, economists like to say, we want to try to find some exogenous variation, right, that r where we can uh, make stronger arguments that the digital development actually led to something else happening in these cities uh, because we know something about, like, when the infrastructure was put in place or when the telecom companies started to provide Internet to these cities and that's more external, right, and we can say this is what drove it. Yeah. So I wonder on that part, I mean, is it is there public information so beyond that, right? Assuming they don't have internet, right? Is there public information, for example, on the number of uh, public hot hotspots available, free Wi hotspots, free Wi Fi hotspots available in a particular city? Because that's that's about access. We talk about internet penetration, can I plug into the internet? Well, that's yeah, that's yeah. one thing. But that's right. you think about tapping into what the government is doing stuff to encourage digital, the digitization of their city. Uh, right. And one of them would be 
Yes. We're going to put in free Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, well, other than Wi-Fi hotspot, or as opposed to the only place you get, you know, digital is if you're mobile. Right. Everybody's got it on their phone. Right. That's one right. aspect of it. Um, but there's a, you know, the, that that's a paid-for service as opposed to a free service. I don't know. No, I, I'm not aware of it, but I think it's a great idea to look for data on that and to look even at the city policies on this because you know they're famous. You know, San Francisco says we're going to go, we're going to probably Wi-Fi everywhere. The universe every, is going to be by this date and whatnot. And so, if any of that thing is happening, I actually think for India and China too. I mean, even the first wave digitization of everyone using a computer is not 100. I mean, it's not as high as in Russia. Yeah, certainly in India it's going to be lower. In China it's getting up there, but there's a big generational difference in, in, in China. Um, so I think it's terms of like digital thing. In India last year we did a study on access of mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So in India that is like 80% is where people are using mobile phones. It's still not 100%. And internet is going to be like next level. Right. And even for mobile phones, there are smartphones and just the basic, which don't have internet. You know, they don't have internet. Answers. Uh, so Kim said actually funded one of those studies for us. In India, I don't know whether Google Trends data is available by city or not. It mm. is available by state, but uh, at least when I looked up, you know, it only gave me by state. It didn't give me the option of looking by city. Mm. Oh. So. so Google is the dominant search engine in India? Yeah. yeah. So that should, but we should be able to figure that out probably. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Google's a company you can probably work with. This. Probably. Uh, yes. And one comment on the issue of the sample because the are at the right end. When we started to think earlier about the research, we, we, we had this had this table. Uh, we thought about having sample for bricks, and then we found out that there are three straight uh, because uh, China and India is much, much bigger in terms of cities, big cities, then come Russia and Brazil, and then we could go to South Africa, then we have just two cities over one million. <laughs> and the city number five is about 200,000 <laughs> population, so you can't really match those. Uh, so the idea was uh, either we go just probably you know, top 10, or top 15, or top 20 cities, or we in, in a more scientific way, we can find, uh, like, we take cities which cover 20% of the population, for example. No, or I actually think a fair comparison to Russia, if we wanted to limit the sample, is to just sample the Chinese and Indian cities. So don't do all of them. Just take, so we, ma we match the distribution roughly, that we just take a couple of the big ones, a couple of the millions, and we take a bunch of the million to two million ones, because that's comparable in a way that's better than just taking the top. Yeah. Right. But I mean, I'm ambitious. I'd like to go after all of them and then see what happens. Uh, it could be we get bogged down on a few of the more labor intensive ones. We could then do a subsample depending on our resources. But for some of the measures, we could try to do all of them if it's just a matter of you know, taking it all from one source. Right. So Jay, I mean, are there any other thoughts on what uh, EY is interested in terms of digital? What kind of measurements would they people find Sorry, interesting? Yeah. The point I raised earlier yeah. about so it gets into the so what, right? It's right. Exactly. So what from business and so what from government? Why does government want their city to be more digital, right? So quality of life is one indicator, right? But economic growth is obviously another. You may not have a long enough period of time to evaluate whether or not you have to go back. A more digitized city gets to a better economic growth engine, and likewise the same issue from a company perspective. You know, do you do you make more money or have better sales? Is a is a is a better internet service provider and more free Wi-Fi lead to more transactions online, right? Or better banking. And, and again, there's you, know, you can't jump to the cause and effect, right? You could have it because it's just a better economic environment because there's companies there. But I, I think looking at whether it's GDP per capita or something like that as some indicator because if you're trying to encourage a policy of better digital access, uh, 
the answer is, well, why? Right? And, and presumably one of them is, you know, you're, get, you're better able to sell goods and services because the economy is more digital, the additional quality of life. There's an economic benefit, presumably. Um, I just don't know how you can correlate that. Because the window of your assessment at this stage is probably too short. Now, if, you, if we got into a point where we did a digital life index every year, right, five years from now, you could start to see perhaps trends. Right, where maybe your Cotter and Berg's GDP growth per capita grows faster because it's a more digital economy than OMS. I don't know. Right. So it, I, it may be too early to say it in the opening discussion, but it'd be something worth thinking about if this was a recurring annual EAMS digital life index, right? Where that's what we did is we applied this methodology to emerging market economies. Uh, because then you've got something you go to government and cities on and say there's an economic benefit for a more digital oriented city that effectively improves quality of life but also generates better economic return. So, so I'm probably jumping to phase two of the study. Because I would say I think the right. value of this will be that it's kind of recurring and ongoing. If we do it once and we're done, we file it away, it, it to me doesn't do much for us. But if you make this kind of the linchpin of why economic growth is partly enhanced by, or the quality of living is enhanced by better investment in digital and digital infrastructure, um, then I think you've got a compelling kind of issue which then you go to what EY is talking about building a better world and work with governments to develop a better place for economies to thrive and people will live better. Right? Sounds like a great brochure. So, so we this have an EAMS funded study that did look at uh, an exogenous increase in the mobile penetration because of the government mandate and uh, what that did to the economic activity and it did increase the economic right. activity. Right. Right. So that's, See, those are the yeah. types of things that it this was, and again, it's cause and effect and which comes first, but the reality is if, if, we, if you could show over time there's a correlation between cities that have better digital infrastructure and better digital penetration leads to a better economic position as well as quality of life, then that's a compelling kind of story to go on a consistent basis to government and say, you want to grow your economies, you want to strengthen jobs, you want to do this. One of the factors is the fall. Right, right. I think those kind of causal arguments are maybe better place for these uh, kind of country specific studies where we can really isolate like these opportunities where they've done something to expand. Uh, and then with that as the background, then these facts become more relevant to people if they know uh, that those associations have been shown to be very strong in other 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 research, um, but what about businesses? I was thinking, you know, if you're if you're if you're trying to set up businesses and deciding in which cities or and, uh, or how I was thinking more on the marketing side, maybe no, understanding the how cons how online retail works differently in different levels of different tier cities, would that be useful information or not so much? Oh, I mean, just just. Be useful, and then financing. Uh, I was trying to think about the right, or also, so retail and kind of marketing kind of applications would be some of this stuff might be useful, right? Okay, great. Any other? What time is it? Sorry, I don't have my clock. Okay. Okay, so we have a few minutes. I know James Lee is here, the Dean of Humanities and Social Science, so welcome, James. We're just finishing up, and then we'll uh, <laughs> move on to the other meeting. Um, okay, so any other, any other um, comments or questions, discussion on, on the digital life index topic at this point? Well, not necessarily a big thing, but to, just to keep it on somewhere on the, on the margins. When we were discussing it internally with, with some other people and from e e EY as well, uh, we, we were thinking that um, 
Well, there are many companies like banks and telecoms and retail companies that, that work on the segmentation of the regions of prioritization where they come first, what's, what city comes next, and things like that. And our idea was, uh, let's do something that would help them to better navigate through the regions where they can, uh, some sort of the navigation tool that they can use other than just GDP per capita in, in a particular region or the size of the population. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, this supply and demand measurements, they help at least uh, kind of provide some sort of the perspective that the, the, the people in the company can think about when they prioritize the region, so they, when they build the regional uh, strategy, which is um, still not a perfect uh, methodology, but if we could keep it and think on the way how it could because I think it, the, the general notion of, uh, well, the more digital you are, the better economic opportunity is, is what we all, all expect, but as, as discussed, we will probably be able to judge on the, 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 the larger span of the, the years of observations. But this sort of thing, they, they can be more uh, momentary impactful. So if we uh, can at least identify medium, medium, medium by and large sort of categories where there is a gap or where is the, the, the opportunity. So this might have a, at least a hint. We are not trying to provide an index, which is not our job. By yeah, just a resource. But, but the, 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 the kind of some sort of the hint, uh, 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 supported, uh, support to their navigation, support to their strategic exercise. That would probably be something that we would, we would be happy to see it kind of kept in the focus. Oh, it's just... Okay, thank you. Um. Okay, any other comments? I was, uh, I was thinking if EY has clients who n have good data on uh, <laughs> finance, online finance, uh, on online banking and other things, we that might be helpful too, but probably not in China, I mean, since all the all the big banks are domestic, not multinational, not foreign banks. But they're all a bunch of they're all all your clients too. Clients, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, we can pursue that later. Because <laughs> you're right, it would be good uh, to try to stick to sources that we know we'll be able to get every year. Uh, even I mean I wouldn't rule out proprietary data necessarily, but it has to be where we have a a good relationship and you know there's a basic so, understanding that we so could reflect it. Western markets they'll have you know, bank associations that would actually gather that from all the banks right. and play it back to the banks, right? right. And so you know, the American Bankers Association probably gathers that information from its members and then plays it back to their members. Some of your markets may not necessarily have that, so there are trade organizations that. Right, so we should still explore those kinds of, because uh, sometimes they'll report, but at province level or regional level, not at city level. Uh, but they might have city level data, in which case they might not mind. And I, I guess the other source, at least on the financial side of things, is to check and see whether or not you can get anything out of the credit card companies, right? Uh, again, they, they may or may not be able to tell you whether it's online versus not online payments, but is there anything that allows you to, to kind of find out a footprint of online sales versus non online financial transactions. But I think now in China it's like Alipay and WeChat. Right. Uh, or Apple. And I don't know what that's going to be. Those are proprietary sources. But all clients of EY, I'm sure. I just assume every big company has a client of EY. So. <laughs> the, data, the, the issue is whether you can get it in get a them fashion on a regular basis. Right? Just got an idea, probably we could try it. Because usually banks have separate, separate URLs for online banks. I mean, it's separate from the regular front page. And at least part of the consumers are doing online banking, they will type in this URL. Right. URLs, right? You could try the URLs or the name of the banks, no. the bank specific no. bank names. No, no, if you are a customer of online bank, 
right. you would not usually go first to the general page and then to the online bank page. You will just type the, the URL for, for the online bank directly, at least part. some of them can do. And this data can be opened through uh, probably guys like Baidu or Google, which we should check out theoretically. They may see this type in. And then it will be a proxy of how many people access uh, online <laughs> online bank. Okay, I'm going to close the session now. Uh, so we have a few minutes before the next meeting. Uh, we, we have our advisory board meeting now with Jay. Uh, so uh, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming. I think we should follow up, obviously, uh, sooner rather than later, maybe while some of these ideas are fresh, to at least try to put some structure on what the next steps would be. But uh, maybe we don't have to do that right, right at this minute. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Yeah. I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Well done.